Uh, okay. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for, uh, for uh, coming to join us for this Tory Talk. Uh, our first Tory Talk of the year is given to us by Carmela Bono. Um, she's a, uh, a PhD student at Binghamton uh, at SUNY. Um, and, and she's going to give us a presentation today about, uh, about ant-mediated seed dispersal and how, how it is affected by land use histories. Uh, so please take it away. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do the iconic, I'm going to share my screen because I feel like everyone says that. This is, let me know if you see the presentation mode. Uh, you're oh, good. the slides, good? Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't see my notes. Okay, um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to, to give this talk. If you weren't here earlier, I was talking to Jordan about how um, it's really exciting to present this work to um, a, a non-entomological group. Um, because one, I'm really passionate about this work, and I think that it is really important to have in conversations, especially with um, botanical groups. So um, yeah, really excited. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Binghamton University in Dr. Kirsten Pryor's lab, and um, I am presenting today my talk, so I did edit the title a little bit, uh, Ant Mediated Seed Dispersal in Contemporary Forests. Um, so as the title alludes, uh, my study system is in northeastern deciduous forests. Um, this is a major system in the region, but and the, it is a highly impacted system. And what I, I mean by that is there are a lot of pressures that these forests face in the forms of land use, uh, whether present and historical invasions. So as humans, we really like to move around organisms. And so understanding how those introduced organisms impact these systems is really important. And then finally, in the context of climate change, with predicted shifts in um, climate, how is that going to change these systems, um, the organisms that we find there, and the functions that we benefit from in these systems? So what we know so far about deciduous forests in this region is that um, one particular layer that is very um, crucial and houses a great deal of diversity is the herbaceous layer. Um, this layer not only houses the highest diversity, but is also considered usually an indicator of forest health. Um, and it also contributes to a lot of um, important ecosystem services in forests. Um, keeping this in mind, um, this is, I think, a really nice example. My advisor took this picture of a nice, healthy understory. There's some beautiful trillium here, um, maybe some mayapple there. I'm sure some of you have sharper <laughs> ID skills than I do from this picture. Um, the interesting thing about this community of plants, though, is that while a lot of them are charismatic, showy, um, flower species that maybe most of you are familiar with, um, what I'm sure maybe most of you might not be familiar with is that about 30 to 40 percent of these understory um, herbaceous species belong to the group called Myrmecrochores. I'm going to see if the <laughs> if the closed captioning actually captures Myrmecrochores. Um, so these this group is adapted for seed dispersal by ants in that their seeds have been adapted to have a fatty um, ant reward. And what that looks like is a lot of these seeds have these lipid rich appendages, they're called an eliasome. And this is really attractive to ants because not only is it an important food resource for ants, um, finding lipids in the forest can be sometimes difficult. It also offers a lot of nutrients uh, that are beneficial to these colonies. Now, thinking about the other side of this mutualism, uh, the star, if you will, is belongs to the group or the genus Aphenogaster. There are a number of species in this region that um, belong to this group, but as a whole, they are considered um, keystone dispersers. And really the takeaway is that it has been found that they are responsible for up to 70% of the ant mediated seed dispersal that we see in these systems. So I consider them sort of the heavy lifters, if you will. And um, so getting into this interaction a little bit more, what does it look like? So we have our two players here. Um, 
we have our ant colony and of course our myrmecochore plant species. In the spring, maybe uh, early summer when the seeds uh, fall for some of these species, what will happen is as the ants forage along the forest floor, they will come across these seeds with those lipid rewards, very attractive to these ants. They will take these seeds back to their nests, then remove the fatty appendage to feed to their larva. The really interesting thing is that the rest of the seed, the remaining part of the seed, will remain intact and then the ants will then place the seeds outside of their nest. Um, something that's very well understood about ant colonies is that due to just the high number of individuals, there's a lot of likelihood of bacterial and fungal buildup. So ants routinely kind of, I guess you could call it cleaning their nests. And so a lot of folks think that this is uh, kind of in the sense that ants cleaning up after the lipid appendage is gone, they'll put the seeds outside. But this is really beneficial for the plants because eventually they will be placed in a place that they could germinate um, and of course grow up. So as these seeds begin getting um, placed outside and planted as, as you will, eventually they will germinate, grow up to be parent plants. And um, this interaction is not specific to just this region. So um, this mutualism is actually um, found in four hotspots. And so a study found that the four major hotspots across the globe are of course here in the Northeast, but we've got a cluster over in Europe, um, down in South Africa in the fine bows, um, and then over in Australia. Um, and the mutualism has evolved many times. And so a lot of the structures or the eliasomes, that lipid appendage has evolved in plants independently various times. So it's a really um, interesting and fascinating interaction to study. So of course, it's a lot of me to just show you these, um, you know, example graphics and what this would look like. But I also wanted to show you that in my work, one of the exciting things I was able to capture is actual dispersal happening. And so part of my work to measure ant mediated seed dispersal is I placed these seeds out in forests um, to observe and um, measure ant mediated dispersal. And so there you saw, maybe I can play it again. Yeah, um, here we have an aphenogaster worker. She comes across this wild ginger seed um, and she carries it off across the index card away to her nest um, that eventually will be used to feed the larva in the colony. Um, fun fact, this video was taken on an iPhone. Technology is becoming great these days. Um, okay, so back to thinking about this mutualism. Um, seeing as this mutualism, it, I've stated that it's a mutualism, um, what are the benefits for both of the partners? So, of course, I've kind of uh, mentioned several times already, the ants receive a very critical food resource. Also, um, the time of year that the seeds might fall for some of these ants might be really important because if it's early spring, the ants might not have any other um, lipid resources available, so that's beneficial. And then the plant community has a lot of benefits as well. Things like reduced competition because the seeds are spread out, they're not as crowded, um, so a lot of space is, is sort of, um, you know, uh, increased when they're dispersed. Um, Seeds might also be placed in optimal ma macrocytes. A lot of folks study whether or not um, surrounding an ant nest, if the nutrition in the soil is higher, that could benefit the seeds. And then finally, when the ants bring the seeds back into their nests, a lot of times that acts as a sort of um, protection from seed predators. And so those seeds eventually can successfully germinate because they, are, they avoid threats like rodents and, and maybe other organisms that might eat them. So one thing that ecologists um, that study this particular interaction and also seed dispersal in general is that they consider um, the, excuse me, sorry, the computer paused for a second, but we're back. Um, so what I was saying was a lot of ecologists that study this particular interaction and also larger seed dispersal in general, the thought is that these mutualisms are particularly sensitive to environmental climate change and other disruptions because the interaction requires two partners. And so if anything disrupts one side of the mutualism, the, the 
interaction itself could sort of um, fall apart. And so um, it just makes this sort of um, area of study really interesting and really important thinking about um, all the impacts that I mentioned before in uh, our forest systems. And so when we think about dispersal, we know that it's not only important um, when thinking about plant population growth and community structure, but I am really interested in it because I want to think about it in the context of these um, disturbances that I mentioned earlier. So this leads to my questions today. Um, knowing the importance of this mutualism in the understory communities, today I will be asking and hopefully answering. One, how does land use history affect ant mediated seed dispersal? Two, how does fragmentation affect seed dispersal, this particular mutualism? And then three, how does variation in ant partners affect this ant mediated uh, seed dispersal mutualism, um, specifically thinking about implications for climate change? I think I'm back. We lost your audio. Oh, uh, you're back. Great. Sorry. My headphones like to, you know, keep me on my toes and and keep you awake, me awake. Um, <laughs> so we're, I think I'm good now. No worries. Okay. Thank you, Jordan. Okay. So we're going to move to our first question. Um, how does land use history affect seed dispersal mutualism? So I mentioned before that forests are a major system in this region and they are highly impacted. So the first form of impact that I mentioned before was thinking about land use history. We know historically in this region, many of the forests were cleared for agricultural purposes. Maybe at one point looked something like this, fragmented across the landscape. But we know that over time, um, a good amount of these forests were allowed to regenerate and now represent a majority of our contemporary forests. So that is up to 80% of the forests we have in this region are um, regenerated, or what I will be referring to as secondary forests for the remainder of this talk. A really important area of research is understanding how these forests differ from their untouched counterparts, or what I will be referring to as primary forests. Um, my key question really is looking at forests that have never been cleared, completely cleared for agriculture, how they compare to forests that were cleared and allowed to regenerate. So how am I gonna answer this question? Um, I use a natural experiment approach. So across um, a region of the Northeast, I set up um, 20 paired sites. So that's 10 secondary forests paired with 10 um, primary forests and they are, they range from, if you see here down in region one, around New Jersey and the Bronx, all the way up to the Finger Lakes by um, Ithaca. I have these pairs of forest. In each forest, I set up three 50 meter tra transects. Along each transect, I had five by five meter survey plots. And I had a, um, a variation of types of survey plots. So, in the vegetative plots, I measured everything from canopy cover down to herbaceous cover, all, all the plant species identified, um, and also um, we looked at ground cover. In addition, in the invertebrate plots, I looked at, um, I kind of alluded to the video before, but that was my seed dispersal trial. So I put out seed depots with Myrmecrocore seeds um, covered with a cage to prevent from any rodent uh, interactions. In the same plots, I put out pitfall traps. This was just to help survey our ground invertebrate community, mainly focusing on the ants, but we found some other interesting um, uh, folks as well. And then finally, um, my last set of survey plots, I looked at ant habitat. So I measured the volume of log habitat, so down log habitat, rocks, and leaf litter. We focused on these three main types of ant habitat because it is known to be preferred by our keystone disperser, Aphenogaster, and that's why we focused on that. So what did we find? Um, focusing on the main question, um, we looked at our seed depot data, and I will be presenting a series of these box plots, so just to 
get you all acquainted. On the left will be the primary data, on the right will be secondary data, um, and then if there was any significance will be up at the top um, in the statistics that I ran. And then if you remember in the map, um, we put region in as a random effect because we would expect um, across um, this spread that there might be um, some impact uh, in what we were seeing as well. So what we found with our depot data was in fact that not only was secondary forests, um, not only did they have lower proportions of seeds that were put out, um, less of them were removed. We also found it was more variable. Some of these forests um, shared the same rates of seed removal as the primary counterparts, and some of them we saw no removal. And so now this kind of begs the question, well, why is this important ecosystem function different in secondary forests and compared to primary forests? So maybe the thing that we think about is, well, what's the other side of this interaction? The partners, the plants. So when we look at the Mermecker core species, I looked at the richness um, between the two forests. And we actually found that Mermecker core richness between primary and secondary forests is actually um, similar. Uh, it was not statistically different. Um, and there was a bit of an impact of region. Um, but this could be due to diff other differences. So the next thing I looked at was, could the composition of this community be different between primary and secondary forests? And so we did see, sorry, some um, higher uh, number of species in primary forests compared to secondary forests. But when we look at competition, composition, um, I quickly want to orient you. So this is, I ran a principal component analysis. For those of you that are not familiar with this, Basically, I put all of the um, observational data I had of the Mermecker core species cover, presence and absence data from the primary and secondary sites. I put all that data together in this analysis and it gives me this sort of spatial um, uh, diagram that shows the shapes show similarity in um, or dissimilarity in the communities. So the main takeaway is if you notice the orange triangles or red triangles, secondary forests, they're in a skinnier ellipse compared to the primary forests, which are in a little bit more spread out in a larger um, sort of ellipse. The key takeaway here is that the secondary forests seem to have a, a more specific um, and sort of narrow community of mermecrochores, where the primary forests seem to have more variation in their composition. Maybe some of them had different um, individual species present than others. And so this just shows that there seems to be some sort of effect of land use history on these communities and their composition. So next, um, outside of the two key players of this interaction, uh, another part of seed dispersal that um, maybe some of you are not aware of is that there's a whole host of other organisms that interact with these seeds. So we can think of all these interactors sort of on a spectrum um, with those on the left being positive interactors and those on the right being negative interactors. So starting off, we've got our mutualists. So those are our seed dispersers, our keystone disperser of Phenogaster. We know they benefit the, the seeds when they're present. In the middle, we have what we'll consider neutral or poor dispersers. Um, so that might be something like a carpenter ant, a Campanotus species. They're not known for dispersing seeds. Maybe if they come across one, they might accidentally disperse one, but um, they don't have really a strong effect on uh, dispersal. And then finally, we have our antagonists. That's what I'll be calling them for the rest of the talk. And these are just uh, what we consider seed predators or they damage seeds. And so there are actually some um, ant species, particularly in invasive species like this Nylandaria, um, also known as a yellow-footed ant, they will actually um, harm the seeds and then make them unattractive to our keystone disperser. So um, thinking about this, we can look at, well, is the abundance of these players in um, seed dispersal different? So we can look at the keystone uh, dispersers by looking at my pitfall trap data. And when we compare it between primary and secondary forests, we do actually find that there is significantly higher amounts of primary um, of a phenogaster in primary forests compared to secondary forests. But this clearly is not the only thing that's impacting seed dispersal, so we wanted to look further into other interactors. 
So unfortunately, I do not have the data to parse apart our neutral versus our antagonists in this um, relationship yet. Uh, while the mutualism is highly um, studied and recorded, the antagonists and the neutral ant spe species are not always noteworthy, as you will. So currently, I'm pouring through the literature, really trying to parse apart these two groups. Um, but what I have right now, at least, is all the other ant data. Um, so besides the phenogaster, using, again, that pitfall trap data. And actually, statistically, there is no difference in um, the ant abundances of other species between the two for, uh, forest history types, um, which is quite interesting. Um, of course, this story might change as we start to parse apart, well, who are the antagonists and who are the neutral players? Another way that we could sort of parse apart these differences is with anecdotal observations. And so this is from one of my secondary forest depots. And what I find here is, in fact, the Nylandaria, the yellow-footed ant individuals. Again, I think I mentioned it before, but they are an invasive species in the area. And what you find here is um, they're a little smaller than a phenogaster, and so they'll actually swarm the seeds. And if you see it carefully, they're kind of just picking at the seeds. Um, ultimately, they don't move the seeds. And so when they remove all the lipid, the fatty part of the seed, eventually the seed husk will be kind of just left there and will never be dispersed by our keystone dispersers. Uh, we're back to no audio. Carol, we can't hear you right now. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Please bear with us. <laughs> so sorry, folks. I think I'm back. Okay. Uh, your um, mic. Your mic is a little loud now because uh, you switched. Uh, if you can turn down yours on your end, I think that would be. Yeah. Just a little bit. So sorry, folks. <laughs> you think with all this zooming that um, eventually things would, so how's this? Um, maybe just like a, a just a little bit less. Okay. Nope. Here we are. Oh yeah, it's all cranked up. Calm down, please. Okay, I think that's as low as I can force it. I could also yeah, speak. No, low. it sounds great now. Okay. You know, we're just navigating <laughs> this time. <laughs> this is just part of the part of the uh, virtual experiences. Yes, I, I really wanted all of you to have all of the experiences. <laughs> um, okay, we'll jump right back in. So. Um, I was just concluding that there are a lot of interactors when we think about dispersal. And so, um, so far, I've sort of just been showing you a lot of the comparisons between primary and secondary forests, um, but that none of that really gets to causation um, as to why we're seeing differences in rates of seed dispersal between our forest types. And so something that I tried to um, do instead, let's see is um, I took all of this data together. I wanted to look at a big picture approach. And so I looked at not only the organisms that interact with the seeds, um, but I also took my habitat data. So that's all the vegetative data. We have some abiotic data in there as well, the ant habitat data. And I ran a path analysis. And so basically this sort of analysis, um, I take all my observational data I put it into a path, and I'll show you shortly what that looks like, that I've sort of created and built based off of some assumptions. And when you run it, it tells you whether or not your data um, falls into that path and if it is verified. So what I did here was we can start off with building our path, assuming that our keystone disperser, the phenogaster, has a positive relationship with seed dispersal in that if there's more of phenogaster, we'll see higher rates of seed dispersal. Another assumption we might be able to make is that 
In some cases, when we have other ants or maybe other invertebrates, um, there might be a negative impact on seed dispersal because some of those other ants will be antagonists. Um, so there might be a negative direct impact on seed dispersal. Um, interestingly though, when we think about these organisms themselves interacting, we could assume that other ants might have a negative impact on our keystone disperser because we know that ants, um, the ant community is very, uh, there's a lot of competition between the groups. And so that competition might have a negative effect on our keystone disperser, which ultimately might have a negative indirect impact on the seed dispersal. And then finally, we can assume that in the context of the habitat, um, habitat factors will be impacting not only these interactor groups, our organisms, but also maybe seed dispersal itself. So um, before I move on to the results of this analysis, I quickly wanted to orient you. So, so far you've seen the positive um, relationships will be denoted with white arrows, negative will be in red arrows, and then anything weak or um, insignificant will be in a gray, sort of very thin arrow. And then finally, next to each um, arrow will be a path coefficient. So that's the strength of the interaction. And then next to that number will be, um, if it's statistically significant, there'll be an asterisk denoting so. So moving forward, what did I find? So when I ran my analysis, I did see that there was a strong positive relationship between our keystone disperser and seed dispersal. It, exactly kind of what we would expect. Interestingly, when I looked at the other ants, I did not find a strong or significant impact directly on um, seed dispersal or the number of seeds removed. But when I parsed apart the other organismal data, slugs, um, gastropoda, came up as significant and also came up as having a negative impact on seed dispersal. Um, I want you all to kind of hold on to that because that will allude to the second part of my talk. So I don't want to give it away right now, but just keeping in mind slugs, negative impact on seed dispersal. The next thing I found was that other ants actually did not have a negative uh, relationship with our keystone disperser. In fact, there was a strong positive relationship between the, these two groups. Um, this makes a little sense thinking about that a lot of these uh, individuals or groups might share similar resources, but maybe there's a lot of um, resource and sort of like niche partitioning happening. So um, kind of uh, interesting, but not, uh, not unexpected. And then finally, um, I found that the habitat did not have any significant, so that bottom sort of swooping um, line in, in the path did not have any significant impact on seed dispersal. But when I look at the impact of habitat on um, the organisms, we did find strong, significant impacts of habitat on our two ant groups, so Phenogaster and the other ants. Um, quickly, I, I do need to explain. So this habitat factor was several variables kind of compressed into one using um, a principal component analysis. Um, we put in things like leaf volume, other herbaceous, uh, other herbs, so not remicrocores, um, soil moisture, soil temperature, soil pH. Um, all of these factors were put together. We picked out the ones that seemed to be highly correlated with our organisms and dispersal. And so this is what we found. But really, um, ultimately, I hope to parse this apart a little better. Um, one of the things I hope to work on now is to see how these paths compare between primary and secondary forests. Um, and so it's a, an exciting part of my dissertation that I hope to pick apart a little bit more, definitely. OK, so key takeaways so far of what um, this part of my dissertation has shown is that in Dispersal is lower, I have found, in secondary forests compared to their untouched counterparts. Um, when we find our keystone disperser um, and it is higher, it is attributed to higher dispersal, so it could be explaining some of the differences we see in dispersal in um, primary versus secondary forests. Um, another variable that could be impacting this is our antagonists, because they could be causing lowered seed dispersal. 
And then finally, um, habitat factors could really be impacting um, the invertebrate community and therefore indirectly impacting seed dispersal. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the second question. How does fragmentation affect seed dispersal mutualisms? Um, to answer this question, I'm gonna be talking about work that a, an honors student that was in the prior lab, Wyatt Parker did. This was actually the first summer I was in Binghamton, so it was a thrill to work with Wyatt. Um, and so we recently had a, a paper published too on, on this data, which is really exciting. But let's uh, dive in. And so going back to thinking about who's interacting with these seeds, um, I kind of alluded to before, and I hope you kept track, um, but I was talking about those interacting with seeds, but they were all ant examples. And something that came up in our data that was very interesting, and this is also known in the seed dispersal um, literature, is that in a, a known antagonist that's a non-ant antagonist is um, introduced slugs. So slugs belonging to the group Arian sub um, fuscus, sub fuscus. And um, this relationship has been studied by um, not only my advisor, but some of her collaborators. But it was really interesting to see that um, we, we, we kind of wanted to see whether or not location in a forest might impact this interaction or this negative interaction as you, um, as you see here. So what we did with Wyatt was we set up um, in a subgroup of my natural experiment sites, so uh, three of the forests, we used the three transects in the interior of the forest, and then we set up additional transects along forest edges that were across from a field, bordering a field, and we set up additional plots, but here we put up depots specifically to measure um, dispersal, comparing it to edges. Quickly, um, I would be remiss at this point to not show you a video of this interaction. And so here we have our uh, Arian subfuscus um, interacting with the seeds that we put out. And so this slug is in fact scooping out that lipid appendage rendering these seeds unattractive to our ants. Um, I believe as many as like 12 percent of the seeds were damaged, at least in my part of the research, um, but in, in Wyatt's work we'll see that it's a little higher. And um, it you can see that in the foreground of the video too that really just the slugs leave the husk of the seed left over. And so um, I think another interesting thing would see would be to see how germination is impacted by um, this interaction as well. So what do we find? Well, first, uh, the first thing we wanted to compare, which is pretty easy with our depots, was seed dispersal difference between the interior and edge. So just wanted to update you on the left here. Now, instead of the primary secondary sort of figures, we have interior versus edge, and then they are paired um, with the three the colors represent the different sites. And so we find that um, seed dispersal actually seemed to vary with some edges having higher, some interiors having higher dispersal. The interesting thing, the interesting thing though, though, is that um, when we look at a lysosome removal or the lipid fatty appendage removal by slugs across all the sites, it was higher along the edge. Um, this was attributed to higher abundances of slugs as well. Um, next off, we then wanted to look at, well, if, uh, what could be, what could be impacting the fate of these seeds? So here we have proportions of seeds removed compared to our aphanogaster abundance. And so this line here shows that, yes, there's a positive relationship. When there's more aphanogaster, we have more seeds removed in these depots. However, the opposite seems to be shown. So when, um, seeds are damaged by slugs, the likelihood or the relationship of being removed has a negative um, relationship. And so the story here is really interesting. I, I think it shows that, you know, maybe along edges, the mutualism itself might be intact of seed dispersal, but it really depends on is the antagonist there to disrupt the mutualism and kind of render it um, pointless. So a few takeaways from this um, cool work by Wyatt was that dispersal seems to be variable along forest edges compared to interiors. Seed damage is higher along forest edges. 
and then the loss of that fatty reward, the lysome, seems to result in lower dispersal of these seeds. Finally, um, we're going to move on to the third question in this talk. How does variation in ant partners affect uh, this mutualism, specifically thinking about implications for climate change? So I showed you this map earlier, and um, I did mention in some of the metrics that I've shown today that regions seem to have um, an impact on the variation we were seeing. Um, if I did not, I apologize, I should have mentioned that, but it did. <laughs> um, and one of, the, one of the things, interestingly, that we find across this region, even earlier in the talk, I met, kind of alluded to the fact that there are different aphenogaster species present. So here in region one, we actually had three different um, aphenogaster species, the keystone um, ant. Um, we had a Phenogaster picea, fulva, and rudis. Um, all three of these are considered um, good or considered dispersers. Um, whereas our region two and region three, actually, we only found one species, Phenogaster picea. Um, and so, no, seeing this, knowing of this regional difference in just the ant species that are present really led us to think well, does variation in the ant identity, the partner identity, does that affect seed dispersal? And so to answer this, what we did was we collected um, Picea colonies from three sites, Aphenogaster rudis colonies from three sites where we could find Aphenogaster rudis. Um, and again, this is really just trying to answer could partner identity, so maybe a difference between Aphenogaster picea, Aphenogaster rudis, could that be attributing to what I showed you earlier, this difference in um, seed dispersal it, between our forests. So how did we do this? Well, we had to collect many colonies. Um, this is actually probably one of the funnest part of my dissertation so far. And so we built these colony boxes. So it is some pine wood with plexiglass uh, lice together. We place these boxes out in the winter so that they can kind of overwinter, get a little, um, you know, soggy and decompose. And then in the spring, we check them for colonies. This work was done um, this past summer. So thank goodness, past all of these COVID uh, complications, um, a senior in our lab, Will Smisco, who was also a, a summer scholar at Binghamton University, he helped um, do a majority of this work. And this is a picture of him. I think this was our second colony we found in these boxes, which was very exciting. It makes um, colony collection very easy and they're reusable. Um, so quickly, I wanted to show you, this is what would it would look like if a colony um, colonized one of the boxes. Um, they kind of follow the, we route a, a little um, sort of U shape so that they can um, feel safe. And then um, we'll remove the plexiglass, remove those wing nuts, and then um, collect the colony. They probably weren't very happy that we <laughs> woke them up. Um, one of the key parts of when you do um, colony work is that you need to collect not only as many individuals as possible, but you want to collect the queen. So um, a phenogaster or keystone disperser uh, only has one queen. Some ant species have more than one, but luckily we are dealing with uh, one queen. And so we want to collect the queen because a lot of work shows that if you are missing the queen, um, colonies might function differently, they might act differently, and so um, just a standard of doing this research, you make sure that your colonies have these queens present and then a certain number of workers and um, pupa and larva. So unfortunately, when these boxes did not work, um, the next thing we had to do was search for colonies out in um, uh, my sites, and so a lot of that was cracking open logs, and if those of you I, I don't know how many of you might be familiar with this ent uh, entomological tool. But this is an aspirator. So on one end, you have um, something that can sort of pick up the ants, and then there's a rubber tube that you use um, your lungs to create vacuum with. And don't worry, there's a critical piece of mesh that keeps the ants away from you. Um, I have heard horror stories of when the mesh does degrade, you might get a few ant snacks as you present. <laughs> Uh, or as you collect. And so we aspirate up the ant colonies and then we house them, um, standardized the colony sizes, fed them, um, and just made sure they were happy, happy, happy um, colonies. Once they were in the lab, um, we set up 
all of the, again, some Piscea colonies and some Brutus colonies, we gave them these arenas, these choice arenas. And so we presented them with four different seed um, types. So at the top, we have blood, some bloodroot seeds, uh, some hepatica seeds, wild ginger seeds, and white trillium seeds. Um, the reason why we have this diversity of seeds is we wanted to look at not only is there a difference in the ant species moving seeds, but we wanted to see if there's a difference in preference of seeds. Um, interestingly too, a lot of these um, seeds presented have varying um, phenologies. So hepatica is a very early seed set, whereas a white trillium is very late. And so we wanted to see if there was a story there. Um, when we had these uh, depots out, it was for 24 hours, and we just measured all the activity. So we looked at things like the number of ants foraging, the number of seeds that they removed, and also the type of seeds that they removed. Um, and here, of course, is a nice video of one of our workers working very hard to get her trillium seed back to her nest. Um, I do have to say something about the lab setting. I think they knew when I was recording them, because this was one of the only videos I was able to find. Okay, so what did we find in this work um, with Will? So here we first focused on the amount of foraging activity. So that just means the amount of ants that were out and about in the arena. How did that compare between the two species? So interestingly, we find that all of the colonies from Phenogaster Piscea sites seem to be more active compared to the Rudis colonies. Now the next thing we looked at was, well, how about dispersal? The thing that we're interested, the thing that this whole talk is about, um, how did that flush out? It was actually the opposite. So we found that Aphenogaster rudis ants actually dispersed more seeds compared to their Piscea counterparts, which is very interesting and it was not what I expected after looking at the earlier results. And then finally, I mentioned to you before, is there a preference? Is there a difference in what these ants are dispersing? And so similar to the um, PCA ordination that I showed you before, um, when I ran this analysis, the big takeaway here is that um, the Picea um, colonies, so the skinny blue ellipse compared to the rudest larger kind of wider red ellipse, seems that Picea has a narrower preference in their um, seeds, whereas rudis seems to be more variable in preference and the number of seeds that they moved. Okay, one more thing we quickly wanted to look at to kind of really parse apart what could be impacting dispersal was thinking about other ant behaviors. Um, and specifically, we looked at these same colonies, so the same colonies we used for Will's um, preference trial, we ran aggression trials. So this was done by a junior in my lab, Allison Radin, um, and she worked with me tirelessly. Um, we took 10 individuals from each of our colonies, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you can see this on the left, but we had to paint individual ant abdomens to distinguish them because the species look very similar. I don't know if you could tell in the pictures. Um, after we painted these colonies, we fought them for lack of a better word. And so um, what this would look like is here we have, I believe, two Picea individuals actually teaming up on a third Rudis individual. And then there's a fourth individual of Rudis sort of trying to escape. Um, when this happened, we measured the number of aggression events. Um, we also scored ev aggression events. So what that really means is, okay, uh, a lower score would be if an ant sort of lunges at another ant. Whereas a fight like this, you see, we call it a fight ball. That would be a higher aggression score because that is more deadly. Um, in addition to these scores, we also measured the number of dead ants at the conclusion of the um, interaction and then the number of body parts that removed, were removed. Um, sorry if this is a little <laughs> graphic. Um, so what did we find? The easiest thing to, to look at quickly is just the number of dead ants um, during these interactions. And all the interactions total together, we actually found that Aphenogaster Picea seemed to have the least number of dead ants. So in ant speak, this basically means that Aphenogaster Picea seems to be the dominant um, species in this interaction because if less of those individuals are dying, um, ultimately if they were, for example, to encounter one another, 
um, in nature, we would expect Piscea to win. This is really interesting to think about because if you remember, this whole sort of part of my talk is in the context of climate change. And um, really, when, when we think of these species, there's already work done kind of thinking about, well, what will happen in the context of climate change. And so really the quick takeaway from these figures on the left is that Phenogaster rudis has higher both maximum and minimum temperature tolerances. And so the consensus in the research is that Phenogaster rudis with um, climate increasing will displace Picea colonies. But this is really interesting to think about because if the Phenogaster rudis will be displacing Phenogaster Picea, okay, maybe that means there'll be higher rates of dispersal because we saw that with Will's work. Um, we also saw a shift in seed preferences, so maybe they're a little bit more broad. That's That could be positive. But if um, Phenogaster rudis seems to have lower dominance compared to other ants, this could mean that the interaction is at risk to being disrupted by uh, an invasive ant species. Um, so a lot to think about. So um, the key takeaways that uh, I hope all of you take away from these three sort of um, studies uh, that I've shown you is that seed dispersal seems to be lower in secondary forests. Um, we can think about region explaining some of this variation. Um, but we also could think about the fact that slugs contribute to lower dispersal at edges. Um, there are other factors that contribute to variation in seed dispersal. So thinking about um, presence of our keystone disperser, the abundance of that. Um, could there be uh, other effects of our antagonists? Also thinking about that habitat seems to have an impact on our invertebrates, therefore indirectly impacting seed dispersal. And then ultimately partner identity, so which aphenogaster is interacting with the seeds seems to play a role. Um, and so I, I quickly want to sort of come back to the big picture here, um, thinking, kind of answering this question, well, why is this important? And I really want to hone in on the fact that in the context of restoring these understory communities, majority of these management practices that I've seen are to encourage plantings or maybe seeding the, the understory layer. But I really hope that we take away that um, we need to not only restore the communities themselves, the plant communities themselves, but we also need to think about restoring these essential interactions like ant-mediated seed dispersal. And with that, um, I quickly need to acknowledge the, all the land that I was able to access to do my work. So in Region 3 and Region 2, um, Region 3, the oh, um, Haudenosaunee people of the Longhouse, um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is still very active right now and can be reached. Um, also in Region 2, the Sus Susquehannock people were native to this region. And then in region one, this is the region of the Leni Lenape and the Musky Lenape. Um, they are also still very active currently and can be, um, can be contacted at these sites. Um, and I wanted to conclude with a very nice um, Leni Lenape uh, quote, uh, proverb that as long as the rivers and creeks flow and, and the sun and the moon and the stars shall shine is how long the Lenape will be there. And then finally, all the other folks that made this work possible, my lab, my advisor, Kirsten Pryor, countless friends and family that helped me collect ant colonies, and then of course my funding sources, particularly the Tory Botanics Society, and then um, all the land managers that helped me get to these sites. Okay, with that and all the technical difficulties behind us, I am here now to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great presentation. This was really no interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry. I feel like I um, cut into some of the question time. No, no worries. Actually, this is, this is awesome because like the community is already like typing questions in. Right. They're, very, they're very eager to, uh, to ask some questions. So we're going we're gonna to just get right down to it, right? Okay. Uh, the first one that, that uh, we have for you is, perhaps I missed this, but how did you determine uh, that secondary forests had lower rates of seed dispersal, and how were seed dispersal rates measured? Great question. Uh, so um, I apologize, I could also have kind of glossed over this. So to measure seed dispersal rates, what we did along my transects was we put out seeds for 24 hours. Um, for the first three hours of that period, we monitored the seeds, and that's how I was able to get some of the interesting videos you saw. 24 hours later, we returned to the site 
and kind of captured whether or not seeds were moved. Um, 24 hours is a typical window of ant mediated seed dispersal. And so if it were not to happen over 24 hours, um, the assumption in the field is that um, it's either low or weak kind of dispersal. And so comparing those numbers, that's how we found lower dispersal in our secondary sites. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, all right. And the next question is, are the seeds dispersed by the ants taken to a, to a refuse heap created by the ants? If so, uh, do you think this is an important factor in germination success? I suppose that if so, the re reproductive success of these plants can, de can depend on uh, the density of these colonies. This is some of the really cool parts of this research that I wish I was active in. So what I can tell you that I know so far is that some folks currently have been looking at differences of the microbiota on seeds pre and post ant nest um, sort of housing, if you will. And there seems to be a difference so far, at least in the literature that I've seen. There's a group in, um, I wanna say Louisville, that is looking at this. And the part of the hypothesis is I think what you're getting at, that I think there are some Micro, microbe level differences that the phenogaster colonies and their nests provide for these seeds. And so that might be beyond the sort of like larger scale impacts that I'm looking at of just avoiding predators, which is really interesting. Again, thinking about benefits to the to the seeds. So great question. I wish I knew more. <laughs> well, it sounds like this entire system is about as complex as you could probably expect any, you know, like ecological network of interactions to be. Yeah. You have the seeds that are impacted by the ants, but also by microbes and also by a variety of other creatures in the forest. And no doubt, no doubt tons of, of hidden allelopathy and other mysterious. Oh yeah. Things. Oh yeah. Uh, so another question here, uh, does, does damage just mean the seeds lose their, uh, oh, forgive me, I assume this is the lipid pocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could say that. Uh, and therefore, they are not attractive to a phenogaster. Or uh, does damage mean non-germinating? Great question. And I apologize if I wasn't clear. So um, in the context of everything I presented, damaged meant the lipid um, appendage was removed and no longer attractive to a phenogaster or the keystone disperser. Um, but I, I can't speak to whether or not they will not germinate. That is not something that we um, were able to, to further with the seeds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Amina says the quote that you read at the end was beautiful. Thank you, Amina. I can't take credit, but I had to share it because I thought it was beautiful as well. Uh, so we have time for more questions. If you all have more questions, please write them in the chat and uh, and I'll read them out. Uh, I have I have a question myself. Okay. So, uh, you know, part of the stuff that I find very interesting is is the um, is insect behavior and like the evolution of that behavior and also like co-evolution with with their their symbionts. And these are a sort of symbiont. They are they're mutualists here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Gaster and the and like the trillium and ginger and the understory plants. Uh, what I find very interesting is the dynamic between these mutualists and the invasive species, uh, which I guess I would call the cheaters. Mm. I'm assuming that that the seeds develop on the plants and then drop to the forest floor just below the plant, and then the ants come to forage. They're not coming to like the the plant themselves to take them away like off of the plant that so i that could differ um i think the only case that that might happen okay to off the top of my head i have seen and i know this to happen so the way all, all the mechanisms in which these seeds um dias and, and and drop are so different so you've got i had the four species that i'm more familiar with so our blood root sort of has like a um a capsule that opens and sometimes will like release seeds a little further away from beneath the parent plant the hepatica also seem to have a bit of a, a some kinetic dispersal whereas the wild ginger is very interesting these flowers are below the plant on the ground they kind of rest 
and what happens is the seed pods sort of like decay away <laughs> and the seeds are just like there hmm. and the ants will come and take them. And then finally the trillium are really interesting. Um, they're very late. And there have been times where I've seen a trillium pod cracked open, but the seeds haven't fallen yet, but there are ants within the pod or actively removing. So there's, again, so much interest, um, interesting variation there a lot of variability uh and you also mentioned all of the the antagonistic species that you described they were all um uh, invasive Mm. Uh, the ones that were clearly antagonistic not like the carpenter ants or things like that uh but the ones with very noted noted uh in the literature antagonistic relationships and i was curious there if if all of the known cheaters to this mutualism were uh, were invasive, or if there are any native cheaters as well, because mm. we see that in some other groups of of inter like very very involved mutualisms, like uh, like the yucca and yucca moths and mm. figs and fig wasps and things like that. There are cheaters in those relationships too. Just curious. Yeah. Um, well, so I would assume. So thinking of non ant organisms. Any native slug or or gastropod, honestly, I think um, would be a cheater. The only reason why the Arian subfuscus slug is um, noted in the literature is that they are just more abundant in in some of these forests and these systems, uh, higher than native um, numbers. So, but I still think if a native slug were to come across a seed, still antagonistic. And then, in terms of ants, I don't know. I I don't I don't think off the top of my head I can think of any interactor, native interactor that's not a mutualist that has a strong enough impact that's considered negative. They really are kind of lumped into this neutral group. Okay, I was just I was just curious because it totally makes sense that some of these species, the invasive ones, would become like the dominant affecting yeah. force in terms of antagonism because uh we're talking about about forests that are strongly affected by by you know these land use changes and the in, invasive species are notoriously mm-hmm. adapted. so they, they tend to be like edge specialists and things like that so i do want to say that i think your question is just kind of shows how much more of this interaction there is to study um i think this shows how important a sort of like a natural history push is for this interaction because um, there are species lists out there, but they're so region specific. And, and I, I truly think that there's probably a few cheaters out there, native cheaters out there that we don't know about. Um, And we, it's just not documented. Certainly a a really curious subject. Um, Yeah. We have two more questions. Okay. Um, We have, uh, I may have just missed this, but do you think that the keystone ant dispersers can colonize isolated habitat patches in urban settings? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I think, so here's a good example. Um, I know you mentioned before, Jordan, that um, you folks typically, when this talk happens, it's at the New York Botanic Gardens, Mm -hmm. right? And I know there are beautiful patches of forest in the Bronx, because those are some of my study sites. Um, We do find that Keystone Disperser in those very urban forests, I would call them. Van Cortlandt Park has them. The uh, forest in the Botanic Garden has them. So um, have they been there this whole time? Was there reintroductions? I don't know, but I know they'll colonize urban forests. Do you happen to know much about the uh, the dispersal capabilities of the ants themselves and how far a, uh, say, like, um, well, I guess I don't know too much. I don't know enough about about the dynamics of of uh, generation to generation colony systems. But if if or however they they migrate, mm-hmm. uh, how far they could typically travel. So that's usually called, uh, I believe, a nuptial flight. Or um, I'm sorry, uh, like a queen flight. So when new queens arise, they will fly, interact with males, and then disperse. It's not very far. <laughs> it's not. Yeah very far. I think over many, many seasons, I, I can't, I'm not going to give a specific distance. I'm not sure, but I know it's far. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so uh, are the, is it eliosomes? Is that correct? Yeah, okay. great. <laughs> Sorry. No, uh, you're fine. Are the eliosomes on native seeds more attractive to ants than the eliosomes on, on non-native seeds? This is another great question. You folks are great. Um, okay, so my advisor actually looked at um, the whole question of this system with kind of what this person's getting at, not just native and non-native ants, but also native and non-native seeds. Um, and what my advisor found was that not only do invasive ants prefer invasive seeds, it seems, and that's just, you know, I can't speak for all the seeds, but what she studied, not only do they prefer the invasive seeds, but they also disperse more <laughs> the <laughs> invasive speed seeds. Right. Um, Elizomes, the fatty part of the seed, are so interesting because I think when you saw the pictures, you saw that the, there's a visible fatty part to them, but there's so much more going on. The chemical composition, the hormonal composition of that lipid, um, you can have like the tiniest piece of um, elizome and you would think, oh, that's not attractive to ants. But actually, I believe oh, it's a particular acid that is very attractive. And so the smallest elizome could actually be more preferred by ants just because of the chemical content. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we see in the non-native seeds is what I'm trying to answer with that question. But it's a that's, another, you've opened another can of worms. That's extremely interesting. I mean, yeah. I mean it, that totally makes sense to me because uh, like hymenopterans in general are incredibly receptive to, to yes. chemistry. And this is how they tell each other apart. This is how they navigate their environment. And so it totally makes sense that, that the plants are, are communicating to the ants in, in a method more than just like, here's some tasty lipids. It's like they're yes. attracting them in some way. And also that has some pretty significant implications for for invasive species dispersal as well mm -hmm. and then on top of that too the, the invaders have other things like there's more seeds they produce more seed pods and all the other different dispersal mechanisms it's such a interesting field thinking of all of this in the context of invasive species right yeah uh we have one possibly two more questions here uh there's this is long uh so please bear with me you're fine uh, I could also open it up if it's easier. Oh, it's, uh, you know, uh, if, okay. if it's easier to, to read at the same time, I'm going to read it out loud for the sake of the, the, the video as well. Okay. Uh, so thinking in terms of environmental heterogeneity as experienced by the seedling, heterogeneity is obviously removed uh, by the creation of the anthill. What amount of environmental her heterogeneity remains? Uh, Maybe we'll break it. We'll break it apart. Yeah, <laughs> we'll break it apart. We'll um, this is a good question. So, um, a little bit of natural history of the this keystone disperser, the phenogaster. So they actually don't make an ant hill, uh, uh, like different from what we kind of think about in our backyards when we see ants. Um, a lot of times, the phenogaster themselves will just house or nest in either down wood. Um, if they're in the soil, there's just a one a, a small opening but they don't they don't make it very showy to attract um, predators um, and it's just like uh, hidden amongst the leaf litter and then if it's under um, a rock again one um, opening maybe a few others just for um, you know escaping purposes but they don't alter what I'm trying to get is they don't alter the heterogeneity of the habitat too much I think um, and so I actually think a lot of the environmental heterogeneity remains around these colonies. The interesting thing though, is that these colonies, their nests are ephemeral. So every summer they have a new nest. Usually in the winter, they burrow down into the soil for safety. And then in the spring, they will emerge and find a new nest. Um, I think just to avoid, you know, buildup of bacteria and, and fungal pathogens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, are they like relatively phylopatric? Do they stick around the same like vicinity? I, I think so. I think um, ultimately the things that, as someone that had to, <laughs> to find these colonies, what I can tell you is um, ants do not like it too dry, but they don't like it too wet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think really when colonies are 
sort of um, hedge bedding to find a, a new uh, nest site. It's really thinking about something like that in terms of soil moisture. Um, okay. Yeah. So here's the latter uh, parts of the question here. Uh, do ants select sites for ant hills in which they uh, may uh, shine to the ant hill? I think it might have been a typo. Um, that might be relevant to the plant. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I this actually came up with a conversation I had with um, a friend of mine that's a manager that was like, "Do I plant these <laughs> these seeds near logs? Like, is that better for seeds?" And I was like, "I don't." Um, maybe. So let me answer the question directly. I think that um, if the microsites that the ants are picking for their nests end up being beneficial for the plants. I don't think that's a, um, a strategic thing. It could just be coincidental that that condition is beneficial both for the colony and for the plant. Um, but that is something I think that is still really truly being understood, specifically like site benefits, like right outside of a nest, those benefits to these seeds still needs to be understood. But this is a great question. Uh, it is interesting, and I guess that it wouldn't be too out of the question considering the amount of coevolution that's tying these species together. That mm. perhaps they could be converging on the same, like microhabitat. Uh, yeah. Of interest. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, okay, uh, and then I think the colony. The, I'm sorry. I'm th I think the colonization question was referring to seed movement, not queen movement. Oh. Uh, can the worker carrying the seed transfer that seed to an isolated forest fragment? Great question. Okay. So um, I don't think so. Um, unless that worker is going to a colony that's in a, a isolated forest fragment, but I don't, ants would not um, cross forest edges to another forest. Um, so what we know about these ants is their dispersal distance, like how far they will forage and then disperse the seeds afterward. Dis dispersal distance is maybe in the like, I'm sorry, foraging distance is maybe in the like five meter to three meter ballpark, oh, but dispersal. Very, very localized then. Yes, very localized. And then even that, after they're finished removing the lysome and then they kind of place the seed outside, the farthest they're gonna go is one meter. Mm. Um, so I think when thinking about will this interaction help um, disperse these seeds into isolated fragments, I think that is where, in a, in a restoration context, I think that's where humans come in to help to get the seeds there. But then in terms of maintaining sort of the population dynamics and community structure in a forest, that's where the ants come in. Um, that's 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 very interesting. Um, yeah. Especially just because that sort of, I mean, the the species that they're that they're affecting here that, like, I guess I I sort of myself interpreted the ant mediated dispersal to to move them uh, significantly more distance than than five meters on average. <laughs> but but in yeah. fact, so I mean, but the difference between Zero, <clears throat> zero and five meters can be quite significant to a, a species uh, like, you know, trillium or... Yeah, well, so I, I needed to add a caveat there. Trillium is very interesting because it's been documented that their seed pods are attractive to deer. <laughs> so maybe in Amy's question, deer are the answer to get trillium mm -hmm. to isolated forest fragments. And then in that fragment, the phenogaster will help. Um, but in the case is, of other species, they're they're more restrictive in their dispersal. Yeah, and then some of them are also like rhizobial species too, and so um, already inherently they're going to be very clustered. And so I think this dispersal is really important just to you know get offspring away from their parents and spread out. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, one more thing was uh, Marlies also says, thank you. This was very fascinating. <laughs> oh, no, thank you all. This was very, um, I enjoyed this very much. I, I love being able to talk about this with 
folks other than my advisor and my committee. <laughs> um, and and thank just you for thank you. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, we're happy to have you. This was a, a really interesting talk. Thank you for coming yeah. to speak for us. Of course. Uh, amazing work. Thank you. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, uh, so that, that pretty much wraps up this talk, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we, uh, we are currently solidifying a date for our next month's talk, but, uh, uh, but that, that information will be, will be released, uh, quite soon. And, uh, as always, it'll be put up on the, on the Tory website. It'll go on the Facebook, uh, and also it'll get emailed out to members, um, so uh, other than that, uh, thank you all for stopping by. Thank you all for joining us.